Okay, uh, so I hope this works out. Um, so already, actually, I had to correct the title thanks to Fabio's talk because uh, I had written it with the mixing of uh, the kinetically constrained desync process on the lattice at low, uh, at low density, but of course there are many of them, and I'm just talking about one. Um, before I get rolling, oops, let's see if this actually works. There we go. Uh, I should thank my co-author, Natasha Palai. Uh, the paper I'm talking about here is joint with him. Um, I should also thank uh, some helpful commenters, Daniel Jarrison and Anastasia Raymer, uh, who I talked to quite a bit when, when getting started on this project. Um, with that, I think I'm going to follow uh, sort of David's um, lead here. And uh, since everybody knows already what a mixing time is most of the way through here, and uh, also everybody even knows what a constrained icing process is, I don't have to spend quite as much time saying what those things are, and I can spend a little bit more time uh, talking about math and in particular, uh, some of the sort of organizational lemmas that, that go into the proof, which uh, at least I hope might be useful to some sort of closely related objects. Um, so in particular, the main idea for the proof and the part that I want to talk about today is that people have done already quite a lot of work on uh, the simple exclusion process. And in particular, I'm going to be using a, a, bow, a bound due to uh, HT Yao. And people have done quite a lot of work on already the, uh, the coalescence process. And in particular, I'm going to be using some bound due to Cox. And it would be nice if we could just use those bounds and not do a lot of difficult computations ourselves. Um, so I'll first say what the icing process is that I'm actually interested in, and how those two things at least broadly fit into that process. Um, then I'll talk first about the, the parts of this bound which work well, which is sort of a, a little splitting lemma, um, and the comparison to simple exclusion where everything sort of goes according to plan. Then I'll talk about the part where things don't go quite according to plan and I lose a little bit, which is in particular the comparison to the coalescence process, which is a little bit less sharp. Then I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about conclusions and, and some sort of related conjecture. Okay, so normally this takes a long time, but here I'm just gonna say what the mixing time is, and it's the usual one. Uh, the one thing that I should mention, especially after Alan and Ayal's talk, is that I'm really interested in, in the maximum here, um, and in particular, the lower bounds really depend on that. There are some sort of best cases where, uh, depending on the parameter that I'm interested in, there's some split above some critical value. The best case and the worst case look basically the same. Below that critical value, there, there turns out to be a bit of a split, and, uh, and the best case is substantially faster than the worst case. So I'll get to that at the end, but for now, I'm just talking about the, the worst case scenario. So the, I'm talking about the constrained desync process, so always when I say there's something with a constraint, I should say what the object is without the constraint, uh, and it's just a simple random walk on the hypercube, but I'll uh, throw in a lot of extra details to set the notation. So the idea is, throughout the talk, I have this graph. I'm always going to be talking about the d-dimensional torus, um, although these processes will be defined for other objects as well. Um, I'm going to have uh, my state space being labelings of the graph. I'm going to have some fixed density parameter of 0 less than p less than 1. And as I said, the dynamics here are just going to be the usual simple random walk on the hypercube. Every step, I'm going to choose a vertex uniformly at random. With probability p, I'm going to uh, update the label to be 1. With probability 1 minus p, I'm going to set the label equal to 0. Um, throughout the talk, I'm, I'm going to sort of interchangeably go between 0, 1 labelings and saying a particle is there and a particle isn't there. Uh, one thing, sort of a warning, if you've talk, heard about the constrained icing process before, um, I'm going to say that a particle is there um, when the label is equal to one, and that's sort of backwards to how a lot of people write down the notation, but I find this easier, and in particular, I think the pictures are sort of easier to draw here when I have only a small number of particles sitting around. So, okay, simple random walk on the hypercube. This is sort of well known. It's the, uh, the Ising model at infinite temperature. So what's the, uh, the constrained desync process? Well, the answer is I'm going to be trying to do exactly the same thing, but every once in a while I'm not going to be able to do an update, and actually for this process, most of the time I'm not going to be able to do an update. So a very general version of this is, again, I fix a graph as before, and now, and I fix a parameter, a density zero less than p less than one as before, um, but now I also fix these two other objects, this math um, script c from the graph to subsets of the graph, and also this threshold t, which is an integer, and the dynamics are going to be as before. I'm going to choose a vertex uniformly at random, and I'm going to try to update it. But sometimes I'm not going to update it. And in particular, I'm only going to let the update actually go through if um, the number of vertices which have a particle in them in this set C of VT is at least my threshold number. OK, so this is some very, very large class of processes. Um, I think the most famous of these is probably the East model. And so the idea here is the threshold um, in, in two dimensions is going to be two, and in general in d dimensions is going to be d. And the uh, this special set, c of, of vt, or c of v, 
is going to be all the vertices which are be directly below or directly to the left of the graph. So that's what happens in two dimensions. Sort of the obvious generalization in, in higher dimensions uh, is sort of the same process. So this is the, uh, the Northeast model. I'm not going to be talking about this one, although it's probably uh, the most famous. I'm going to be talking about another one which was in the original paper due to, uh, to Anderson and Fredrickson in 1984, um, where essentially my threshold goes instead of D down to 1. And um, I'm going to allow a vertex to be updated if there's a particle in any spot that's adjacent to the vertex. So this is how the graph shows up. It tells me what I'm actually allowed to update. Um, now, the initial motivation for this was certainly a physical process, but that's not the story I'm going to be telling. To oh, sorry, yes. Anderson, ah, with an E. Ah, yes. OK, but I spelled it wrong. Thank you. Thank you, OK. Um, OK, sorry, so I should correct this. Um, OK, hopefully this, this spelling is correct. So I'm, uh, I'm going to be telling the story uh, that David Aldous told about this process, um, which is instead of looking at sort of the physical point of view, to look at, in some sense, a computer network point of view. So the idea here is that every vertex of the graph, there's some computer or probably you know, some tiny computer or sensor network. Um, the edges correspond to computers that talk to each other. Um, particles correspond to, uh, to some information that we want to store. And the reason that you might be interested in doing something vaguely along these lines is, um, you know, if, of course, one can store information by just throwing it on a computer and having it sit there. But if computers fail reasonably regularly and are replaced with other computers, that's bad. The information is only going to last, on average, about the same amount of time as a computer lasts. And so instead, the idea is you should stick some information on a computer, and then every once in a while sort of move it around. And in particular, if there's already um, if there isn't very much information, if, if there aren't very many copies of the information being stored, you want uh, the process to sort of naturally create more copies of that process and, and to sort of stabilize. Um, so that's, that's sort of the basic idea why you should have some interacting particle process. And the constraint dicing process is sort of a, a reasonable one to write down here. Um, in particular, the stationary distribution is sort of easy to understand, and it has the properties that we would want this sort of stationary distribution to have. And the mixing seems sort of about as good as you can hope it to be on this sort of process. So that's the idea. It also suggests a little bit what the parameters should be of interest. And in particular, we want the, uh, the density parameter p to be roughly some constant divided by the size of the graph. In other words, if storage is expensive, we, don't want to be we won't want half of the computers to be storing a copy of every piece of information. We want some redundancy, but, uh, but not very much. OK. So that's the story. And again, just to make this sort of concrete, um, there are many constrained icing processes. But today, I'm just interested in this one. We're going to fix some dimension d, some scale parameter c. Um, we're only going to be interested in the, in the d-dimensional torus. And we're going to be um, setting the, uh, the density to be some constant c divided by the size of the graph. And that's sort of the scaling that's of interest. OK, so what does this guy look like? Well, there's sort of one easy heuristic, which is where the simple exclusion process is going to come in. Um, and that's that the process looks a lot like the simple random walk, um, at least if you squint a little bit. So the idea here is, uh, at stationarity, at least, there are relatively few particles, only c and uh, some, some constant number c in a very large graph. So they're generally very far apart from each other. And so what happens if you have one particle is roughly at rate n um, 1 over n squared, you're going to spawn a particle next to where your current particle is sitting. So you go from the picture on the left. Oops, I can actually point to that, can't I? Yeah, I go on the picture on the left to the picture in the middle with two particles next to each other. And that sticks around only for roughly n steps before jumping either to the left or to the right. So of course, there are a couple of other things which in principle can happen. But if you're focusing on one particle, this is basically what's overwhelmingly likely to happen the vast majority of the time. So the idea is if you sort of squint and ignore the fact that uh, roughly one out of n times you have, you have this going on, you, you ignore those sort of transient particles, you really look like you're just doing simple random walk, um, very, very slowed down. And so that heuristic is pretty good as long as, again, as I said, you sort of squint. As long as nothing else happens, you don't get a third particle showing up before this has happened. Um, and as long as these components don't get too close to each other. Because when components get too close, something bad can happen. So that's the heuristic, and it led to the following. Con oops, uh, sorry. Led to the following conjecture uh, due to David Aldis. So I'm going to let the mixing time of the uh, of the constrained dicing process be this tau mix KCIP. And let the mixing time of simple random walk on the graph be tau mix SRW. And he suggested the mixing time of the constrained dicing process should roughly be the mixing time of simple random walk um, multiplied by this sort of scaling factor to reflect the fact that the constrained dicing process is moving relatively slowly. 
So this is a conjecture um, from 2002. And uh, this bound is correct for the one-dimensional torus, which is what uh, he was studying at the time that he wrote this down. Um, it also more or less suggests a proof, right? So we, we sort of are going to squint a little bit and imagine that we're just doing simple random walk. And whatever simple random walk is going to do, this thing should more or less do the same thing. Um, it's obvious this can't quite be a proof. Um, in particular, if you're looking at the stationary distribution of the constrained icing process, um, it does, there, you do need to have some particle splitting in order to reach stationarity. And so in particular, you can't compare to a particular copy of simple exclusion with a fixed number of particles. But the hope is that that's not too bad. Okay, but this would be a short talk if everything worked out perfectly. So there's something else that you have to worry about. Actually, a couple of reasons that that conjecture can't quite be true in general. Um, and so here's one that seems to cover most of the examples that I've been interested in. And that's what happens uh, in sort of the worst case scenario. And in particular, how do you get from a very bad starting state, which has a very high density, down to a starting state which has uh, a sort of a standard density with only a small number of particles? Um, so what can happen? Well, the, the thing that, that sort of you first realize when you're trying to make this happen to go from, from this picture, oops, Oops, this picture on the left to the picture on the right, is that here, okay, so you can remove one of these particles immediately because they're next to each other, they satisfy the constraint, but, and, and also up here, but these other particles, you can't remove in sort of one step, right? You can't remove a particle, in particular, you can't decrease the number of components until the components have been involved in some sort of collision. And so this suggests that basically a lower bound on, uh, on the amount of time it takes to go from high density to low density is the amount of time it takes to have very many collisions. Um, and so in particular, you can imagine, since the individual components are basically doing simple random walk, that the coalescence time um, for this walk is going to be essentially a lower bound on the mixing time um, for the walk. So just to sort of a brief reminder. Oh, sorry? Yeah. Ah, okay. So just to sort of as a brief reminder of what the coalescence process is, um, the coalescence process, I can do it by yt, and the idea here is you start um, a random walk with k particles on, on k different vertices of the graph. And at every step, with some probability, you, you just hold and do nothing. Otherwise, you, take, you choose one of the particles and it, it takes a simple random walk step. Whenever two particles collide, they merge. And so the simplest way to write this down is you have some list of particles and you just remove one of the particles from the list. And so the number of particles in the list is, is going to be shrinking and eventually it's going to go down to one. And I'm going to define the coalescence time sort of roughly as the first time that the number of particles is very small, and in particular, small relative to this, uh, to this density parameter that I'm interested in. Okay? So it, it turns out that, this, is base, that the, uh, this coalescence time, or the expected coalescence time, really is a lower bound on the mixing time of the constrained icing process, um, at least in this regime. Um, and so the heuristic can't quite be right. I should say that this is a lower bound, but it's not uh, completely obvious that this should also be an upper bound. Um, and here's sort of one simple reason that this at least isn't directly an upper bound. And it's that uh, when you have a collision of particles, you don't always reduce the number of, uh, of components. And so here's sort of a, a typical collision that I've drawn. What happens when a collision happens is I have two particles, this upper one and this lower one. And when they, colli they collide, when you draw a particle in, in between them, and so you go from two components to one component, and then there's sort of three things that can happen after a small number of steps, roughly order of n again. So the good things that can happen is you kill, say, the top particle, so you go down to here, and then you kill one of those two particles and you're left with one particle in the end, or sort of the same path on the right. But one third of the time you kill the particle that you just added, um, and so you go back to sort of the same position. And so, okay, essentially when, when this happens, you end up that a collision counts roughly for two thirds of a collision. Um, and so you should think, well, that, that should be more or less good enough. And I suspect that probably in the, in the end it will be good enough. But it turns out that actually it should count for quite a bit more than two thirds of a collision. And if you want to get really the right mixing time bound, you somehow have to account for that fact. So this isn't quite, uh, this isn't quite an upper bound, although it's going to be pretty close. OK. So that leads to sort of the following obvious modified conjecture. We know that uh, the simple random walk heuristic is basically true, and that should be basically a lower bound on the mixing time. But also we have to have this coalescence event happening, and that should also be a lower bound on the mixing time. And the sort of the natural conjecture is that if both of those things happen, then mixing should have occurred. There shouldn't be any other obstacles. OK, of course, this is basically redundant in our case, but, uh, but I'm keeping, down, keeping the old conjecture there anyways. Um, 
So what does this actually look like for simple random walk on the torus? Well, for dimension one, it doesn't change anything having this extra term. So we, we basically knew that was true because we knew that the conjecture was true in dimension one. Um, for dimension two, it suggests that rather than having an n squared, uh, sorry, an n cubed mixing time, the mixing time should be n cubed log n. I'll talk about that again a little bit in the conjecture, what's going on there. And then for dimension d greater than or equal to three, it actually has a very large effect on the mixing time. In particular, rather than being uh, n to the two plus two over d, um, which is sort of what the simple random walk heuristic suggests, uh, this says the mixing time should be roughly n cubed instead. Okay, so that's sort of the goal. Um, and indeed, it's basically true. So in particular, what we show is that if you fix your scale parameter c and you fix the dimension d, that the mixing time is, uh, is somewhere between n cubed and n cubed log n. Uh, we didn't optimize very much the upper bound. We believe the upper bound is, is fake, that the lower bound is the correct answer. If you go through the proof carefully, you can replace the log n with something a little bit smaller. I think log n over log 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 n is, uh, is not so hard to get. Maybe one could be a little bit more careful, but uh, it, it doesn't seem incredibly worthwhile uh, to sort of optimize here because there, there turns out to be an obstacle to getting down to one. So this is sort of our main result, at least that this uh, modified conjecture is, is pretty close to true. Okay, so that's where we are. Where am I hoping to go? Um, the hope is that we can sort of split up the mixing time bound in such a way that there are some objects that are more obviously relevant to these heuristics, which bound the actual mixing time, and then actually do some of the comparison arguments. Uh, again, the first of them, comparison to simple exclusion, ends up being pretty nice. Uh, the coalescence process ends up being substantially less nice. OK, so how is the organization going to go? Well, as I said, I want to compare to simple exclusion. That's really sort of the guiding heuristic. Um, and as I said, there's an obvious problem, right? The state spaces for these processes are extremely different. So we have to have some way to throw them onto at least comparable state spaces um, so that we can hope for a comparison argument to go through. And so this is what I do. I divide my state space, which is 0, 1 labelings of the graph, into these different chunks, um, these omega k's, where omega k consists of all labelings which have exactly k particles, and furthermore, no two particles are adjacent. And then I have this remainder object, omega tilde, uh, which is sort of everything else. And the idea is that that, in some sense, doesn't matter. It's always basically transient. And then the idea is that we should, we should bound the mixing on the restricted chain omega k via comparison um, and then use the coalescence process to show that you don't spend very much time outside of omega k for k small. Um, and then finally, you have to do something to deal with what happens to mix in between the, the omega k's for k small. And I'm not going to go into that because it, it's sort of annoying and, uh, and I think not, not terribly interesting. OK, so that's the basic idea. So what, does it, what should a bound actually look like? Um, well, first of all, I should say what, what these restrictions actually are and how to relate them to the original process. I'm going to define something that I've heard called the projected chain, but uh, which I believe was referred to in the morning tutorials as the trace of the chain. It's really the same object. This XTK um, is going to be following the, process, the constrained icing process XT, but only watching it when it happens to be sitting inside of omega K. So the idea is, again, I, I create this, these privileged times phi k, which are all of the indices for which the constrained icing process happens to be inside of, of, of omega k. And then I just follow the process inside of there. Um, so this has sort of the, the desired effect of allowing us to sort of squint our eyes and not pay attention very much to, uh, to what happens when you have two particles that are adjacent to each other at the possible cost that sometimes you're going to have two particles that are adjacent to each other. You're going you're gonna to go from omega k all the way to, up to omega you know, 5k or, or something very, very far apart. And so we're losing a little bit of control there, but not so much. I'm going to define tau k to be the mixing time of this guy on omega k, of the mixing time of the trace. And then it's clear that that can't quite be everything. You can't just deal with mixing on, on each of the uh, individual omega k's. You have to deal with what's going on in between them. And so I'm going to let tau hat i to j be some measure of the interstate mixing. Um, and since I'm going to change this bound a little bit, I'm not going to say uh, too carefully what exactly I mean by that. But the hope is that the mixing time should be something less than um, the maximum of the mixing times on these tau k's multiplied by some sort of interstate mixing bound. So that's the, the sort of hope that one, one could have. And there are actually a number of theorems which make this careful. So the first one that I'm aware of is due to uh, Dana Randall and Neil Madras in 2002. Uh, so they get a, uh, a relaxation time version rather than a mixing time version of the theorem. But, um, but otherwise, it's exactly as stated. And then in 2004, there was a refinement due to uh, Jerem, Sant, Tali, and Vigoda. Um, 
And what they managed to do was, was sort of divide this through by a measure of uniformity. And so again, without saying uh, too precisely what that means, the idea is that if you, uh, if you have a very high probability of going from omega k to omega, to, to, from omega i to omega j, which is uniform in the initial starting points in omega i, then you can sort of divide through by that uniformity. In other words, you sort of get mixing between states and mixing within states happening essentially at the same time due to that sort of uniformity. OK, so this is a bound that it seems like it would be nice to use, but there are a couple of problems with using it as stated. So there's sort of a minor problem, right, that uh, I have these omega tilde, these remainder terms, and OK, it's not there. That's probably not so hard to deal with. Uh, there's a second problem that I have to deal with the mixing time for all k's here. Um, and that's sort of inherent whenever, I, as far as I know, you use these sorts of relaxation time arguments. So that seems like a, a bit of a problem in that the simple random walk heuristic is certainly going to collapse for k large. On the other hand, you could hope that something else nice is happening for k large. So th this is a problem, but perhaps not un unconquerable. And then there's this major problem, which is that the interchain mixing time, this tau hat uh, one to n term, is very, very large. Um, it's easy to check for sort of any sensible measure that it should be at least order of n because you can't jump um, much more than about one step um, in this sort of interstate chain. Um, and the moves between the chains are extremely, high, extremely, extremely far from uniform. So corrections of the sort um, due to Jerem et al. in 2004 aren't going to save you. Um, and in particular, you might notice, right, that if you're in omega k in sort of a standard position, you're extremely unlikely to jump down to omega k minus 1. Oh, well, in fact, you can't jump down to omega k minus 1 unless you happen to have particles that are adjacent to each other. Right? So, so basically, that's not going to happen. And so somehow one has to deal with that. OK. So I'll, I'll say about a couple of terms that let us, let us get out of this sort of problem. Um, so the first is that I, I don't want this tau hat 1 to n. In particular, I don't want a multiplicative dependence here. And so I want to instead replace this with some sort of drift condition to get out of the states that are extremely unlikely. So I imagine I have some drift condition of the following form. I let vt be the number of particles that are sitting around at time t. Um, and I imagine that the, the expected number of particles after roughly epsilon n cubed steps is going to be some constant fraction less than 1 of the number of particles that I started with at time t. So in other words, if I'm willing to wait a reasonably long period of time, and in particular some amount of time that's roughly comparable to, uh, to sort of hitting times between particles, then you end up getting many, many coalescence events, and so you get this sort of drift condition. So that's going to take care of part of the problem. Uh, the other part of the problem is that the drift condition is too coarse, and this, uh, this correction um, term wasn't sort of good enough. And in particular, there was this issue that, you were, that the probability of going from omega i to omega i plus 1 or to omega i minus 1 depended a great deal on which state you happen to be sitting in, um, at least over short time intervals. And so the thing to notice is that although this probability is extremely um, far from uniform over short time intervals, say of order n squared, it's actually very uniform over time intervals of side n cubed. And so I define these two objects as L1 of i and L2 of i, which uh, are ways to measure that without getting into the details, which perhaps are not so interesting. Um, the first one measures how long you stick around in a state, again, sort of uniformized over, over all points in the state. And the second one tells you something about the probability of jumping between states. And so as long as those two are relatively large, then you're, you're sort of happy. And I, I create this, uh, this measure gamma k, which, uh, which, which takes that into account. And again, just to sort of call back to this, this, par this paper from before, this gamma term here, the correction that I end up with, uh, is exactly an averaged version of, uh, of the term in that paper. OK, and that's sort of enough. So we get this bound, which is horrendous compared to the other one. It has many more terms, but it lets me do uh, exactly what I wanted to do. So in particular, um, I no longer have this multiplicative worry um, about the interchain mixing time and the within chain mixer mixing time. I get, uh, oh, I can do this. I get this sort of uh, this coalescence thing that's happening, which takes n cubed log n for the drift condition. I get the maximum as an additive term. I get this n cubed, which I'm not going to talk about. And then I get the interchain mixing time, which, ha which is, has a terrible dependence, this exponential dependence on the parameters that I wrote down. But it turns out everything's sort of O of 1, so I can more or less ignore this in the regime that I'm interested in. So this is the bound that I get. And actually proving the bound ends up being uh, roughly as long as it took to, to define all of these terms. And in particular, it follows from this work of Yuval Perez and Perla Susi, sort of independently were work of Rivera Oliveira, comparing hitting times and mixing times. And so really, this is, this is effectively a hitting time bound.
So this fixes the problem. We get to really deal with uh, the three things that I was interested in completely independently, and then end up turning them into a bound on the, on the constrained icing process. So that part worked uh, roughly as well as I could have hoped. And then the next thing is to say uh, how this relates to the simple exclusion process, which is also a part that more or less worked um, as I hoped it would. So I'm going to write YTK to be the simple exclusion process with K particles. Um, so the simple exclusion process is, is extremely similar, uh, simple exclusion process with K particles is extremely similar to having K independent random walks um, on, on a graph. The idea is you have K particles that are sitting on the graph. At every step, you choose an edge uniformly at random, and you switch the labeling on the two parts of the edge. So this is a simple exclusion process. Again, as long as two particles aren't next to each other, each particle is just doing simple random walk in some very lazy way. And that has state space omega k prime, which is all, uh, all labelings of the graph, which have exactly k particles. So that's ytk, the, and that's something that, that people know quite a lot about. Then we have this other object, this xtk, which is the trace of the constrained icing process um, on, uh, on omega k. And so omega k, remember, looks very similar to omega k prime. It's just a little bit smaller. It's all of the uh, states in the graph where you have k particles, no two of which are adjacent. So these are the two objects that I'm interested in. And remember, the, the thing that I really want to know about is the mixing time of this XTK object. And so what's known due to, uh, due to a bound for Yao is that the low, log Sobolev constant of the uh, simple exclusion process, once I've done suitably rescaling so that it's sort of moving at around the same rate as the constrained icing process, is uh, n to the 2 plus 2 over d, which is what I wanted. And so I want the mixing of, uh, of the constrained icing process to be not so much worse than that. Oops. So that ends up basically being true. Um, it's, it's almost a one-line proof um, once you've done some suitable rescaling. In particular, these transition probabilities for the simple exclusion process are never much bigger than the transition probabilities for the constrained icing process, as long as you're only paying attention to what's going on in the smaller state space omega k. And so there, there are a large number of comparison results um, going back as far as I know to Daikonis and Solov cost in 1996, but, but presumably uh, sort of related results from before that, which tell you that yes, as long as you have that sort of condition up there, then uh, you get essentially the same relationship between Dirichlet forms, which also gives you a sort of similar relationship between, uh, um, between spectral gaps. And in this case, because uh, the, the stationary distributions are quite nice, also bounds on the log Sobolev constants. So everything would be perfect if, if these two state spaces were the same. The state spaces aren't the same, so the sort of standard comparison results give you infinities. Um, and so really the issue is you just have to deal with the infinity in almost any way, and almost anything is going to work. Since I wrote a paper, I, I cite my own paper for this, but I'm sure there are many, uh, many other versions here. And really the idea here is just to notice that you have a, a smaller state space inside of a big state space, and that everything is going to be fine as long as the holes in the big state space aren't very clumped up. And so it turns out almost anything you write is going to be good enough for the type of bounds that they want. And so you get, you get sort of the desired condition, the mixing time of, uh, of the trace of the constrained icing process really does look like n to the 2 plus 2 over d. Um, and then you've got some logarithmic terms to deal with the fact that, uh, that everything goes through the log Sobolev constant, and so you lose a little bit there. OK, so, so that part, I think, uh, went re reasonably well. In particular, the bounds are, are relatively simple. Proofs are, are also relatively simple. Um, and so where are things going to go over after here? We had two more terms left in the splitting lemma that we had to deal with. Um, one of them is mixing times, uh, mixing between parts of the partition. And the other is dealing with this initial transient behavior, which we know is going to be slower than the mixing time um, of the traces. So as I said, I, I'm more or less going to be ignoring the mixing between parts of the partition. It turns out that that's actually sort of uh, the, the bounds that you need to get that to work out nicely are extremely similar to the bounds that you need to, uh, to deal with the uh, drift condition. And so in some sense, once you have the second one, um, the first one is, is a sort of strictly harder, but will follow um, for more or less the same arguments. OK, so I'm just going to be talking about the drift condition. So again, the idea is we start off in this terrible state over here. We want to end up in this much better state over here. Um, and so how do we make sure that that happens? Well, I think the naive idea is to say that we're going to have some sort of a, an average drift condition. And so I think perhaps the most natural thing to say when you're looking for this sort of drift condition is what would happen at stationarity. And so in particular, if I condition on the number of particles, but not where the particles are and draw them otherwise from stationarity, what tends to happen after one step? 
And the answer is, after you do this annealing, the expected drift looks something like this. Um, it's, it's very, very, very fast. And so you might think, well, okay, what can, horribly, what can possibly go wrong? Maybe that's basically what, what's happening. Um, and so, okay, the first observation is that can't be exactly what's happening because there are some terrible states where you have drift in the wrong direction. So this is sort of the worst possible condition. You can have this checkerboard pattern up here, right, where you have particles in exactly half of the states, but no two of them are touching each other. So I can't decrease the number of particles because I can't update any of the vertices that have particles in them. On the other hand, I can update all of the vertices that don't have particles. And so on average, we're going to be going in the wrong direction at least for a little while. It's easy to check, of course, that for virtually any measure of entropy or whatever that you care to name, these sort of checkerboard patterns are going to die very, very quickly. And so you might imagine that you can sort of enumerate all of the bad things that can happen and try to get rid of the checkerboard states and the sort of pseudo checkerboards and all of that sort of thing. And that maybe if you, if you pay very, very close attention, um, you can get rid of all of these bad states and just have a drift condition as if you're in stationarity. Um, OK, so we tried this for a little while, but there's at least one major obstacle which says that this can't work out too well, which is the drift condition on the previous slide is actually false. Um, and it's, in fact, it's, it's sort of not even the, the correct order of magnitude. So however we're going to be getting rid of these bad states, it can't be too efficient because we know that you don't look anything like drift from stationarity once you start at a high, uh, at a high density state. OK, so at this point I basically gave up and thought, OK, I'm not going to be able to deal with any sort of global measure of what, how, how bad the states look at. Look, I'm instead going to be looking at sort of purely local measures. And so the idea here is that you're going to have certain collisions. Um, and once you have a collision, you can more or less ignore what's going on in the rest of the graph. So OK, everything might look like a checkerboard, but, uh, but you more or less can't see it. So the idea here is we have this big graph, which OK, I've, I've, I have some collisions here, but we're paying attention to this one. And so when you look at what happens to this tiny corner of the graph, you end up with this, this diagram that I drew earlier, right? where one third of the time you have a particle on the left, a third of the time you have this particle here, and a third of the time you end up with two particles. And, um, and the idea is that once you have this sort of collision, it's relatively unlikely for anything else to happen. The vast majority of the time, if you just pay attention to this tiny chunk of the graph, nothing is going to interfere with you. And all of the interferences between over the graph over this likely time frame are sort of of constant order. You can't go more than 10 or so steps away. Um, you can't influence what's happening more than, more than some constant number of steps away. OK. So in other words, in order to show a drift condition, rather than show a drift condition sort of at stationarity, we're going to do a, a sort of three-part argument. The first part is to say that there are very, very many collisions. And that's where the coalescence process is going to pop up. Um, and then the next step is to say that uh, the collisions are more or less resolved locally. In other words, that this picture isn't lying too much. Um, and then we have to also show that the collisions aren't too pathological, which is, OK, something I'll, I'll briefly say in a moment. OK. Oops. Sorry. Great. So how do we actually show that there are a lot of, co uh, of collisions? Well, as I said, we think that the, gra that the process, um, when you zoom out, looks a lot like simple random walk. And so it would be nice to say, well, we know how often simple random walks collide. The constrained icing process is sort of nicer than simple random walks. And so it should have sort of a similar number of collisions to what's going on there. Um, I suspect that that's probably true. But um, we went for a much, much more direct approach, which was actually to embed the coalescence process or a coalescence process inside of the constrained icing process. So the idea is we start at some state of interest with a bunch of uh, particles sitting around. And, inside ever, and we start a coalescence process in the following way. We put a coalescence particle, which are these red dots, one for every connected component of the constrained icing process. Okay. And actually, uh, the, this picture is lying a little bit in that uh, you can see we have these sort of three, size three components. And actually, when, when, you, when you write things down carefully, it turns out that that's sort of a bad idea. You want to do some initial burn-in period to make sure there aren't any big chunks here, because uh, this will, these sorts of things can severely influence how well the coupling actually goes. But if you couple from sort of a, a nice position, you can check that uh, this coalescence process, these red particles, for the most part, stay inside of the constrained icing process at least long enough um, to record a bunch of collisions. Okay. And so it's easy to check that if you have a coalescence process 
um, sort of a particle i in the coalescence process and a particle j in the coalescence process, and they've both stayed inside of their component of the constrained icing process for a long time, then whenever those two particles merge, then definitely there must have been a collision and the constrained icing process that surrounds it. So in other words, we're going to count collisions of the constrained icing process by counting collisions of the coalescence process and hoping that nothing goes, uh, goes, goes horribly wrong. So there are sort of two things that one can imagine going wrong. Uh, I think the most obvious is that sometimes you're going to have collisions for the, constraint, for the coalescence process uh, that don't correspond to collisions for the constrained icing process because this, this simple random walk heuristic is pretty good, but it's, uh, it's certainly far from perfect. And you can sort of break this down into three things that can, that can possibly go wrong. So one option is that the, this coupling that I wrote down between the, the icing process and the coalescence process is going to break down um, for a component that hasn't yet touched anything, hasn't gone near anything, a component that's just sort of sitting by itself um, far away from the action. And so you can check that uh, if you do the coupling nicely, that this only happens if you manage to get a component, an isolated component of size four, and that actually basically never happens. So it turns out that, that the coalescence, that the coupling is pretty good um, as, long as, uh, as long as you don't have too much interaction. Of course, we're interested in the interaction, so the second thing that can go wrong is that the, uh, the coupling can break, not when, you're very, very, when components are very, very far from each other, but right before a collision happens. And so it turns out the way that the coupling is done, and, and in fact, the way the generators are done, you can't really do better than this. Um, the coupling can break down, or at least you can't do better than this in a Markovian way, sorry possible you can be more clever in some other sense. Uh, but it's possible for the coupling to break down immediately before a collision occurs. And so it turns out that actually this happens quite a lot of the time, uh, you know, roughly half of the time you end up with this problem. Um, but okay, half of the time isn't all of the time and, and we can sort of live with that. We don't overcount by too much when that happens. And then the last thing that can happen is that, you know, these bad things that happen in part one and two, you end up with these sorts of ghost particles running around which have been uncoupled from the constrained icing process, and maybe all of the collisions that you're counting in the, con in, in the coalescence process are actually these sort of uncoupled ghost particles that are running down, running around, and you shouldn't count them for the constrained icing process. But it turns out, while this definitely does happen, you can sort of check that once a ghost particle has been involved in a bad collision, you shouldn't have counted. It's merged with something. So either you have fewer ghost particles, um, or it's merged with, with a particle that, that's actually a, a sort of of interest. And so this can, only ha this, this can happen, but it in some sense can't count for everything. Right? The ghost particles can only be involved in one collision before you've reduced the number of ghost particles. And so if you keep track of the uncoupled particles and the coupled particles, you can see this last thing, this last thing can't be a major problem. At least it can't be a bigger problem than the other. Okay, so this is really the main problem that we, we want to count collisions, and sometimes we're counting collisions that, that really haven't happened for the constrained icing process, and we need to deal with that. Uh, and, and this turns out to actually sort of be most of the proof, is checking that these bad things don't happen very often. Um, the other thing that can happen, at least occasionally, or at least that certainly one has to take into account, is that you can have a collision which is not a useful collision. And so I said before that sort of the prototypical uh, collision in, in this process happens when you have two individual part size one components and you add a particle in the middle. And so we saw that this bounced off essentially one third of the time. So you count a nice collision for roughly two thirds of a collision. But there are not nice collisions that happen occasionally. And so here's sort of the simplest not nice collision, um, which is what happens when you have two components of size two that meet up. And so that's what's happening at the top. This is sort of the generic picture of what's going on. You end up with five particles that are next to each other. And again, bad th other things can happen, but sort of the typical evolution of this component over short time scales is that it's going to start breaking up. And so, okay, I've traced the entire path, and I'm not going to go through uh, all of the details of the path. But the basic idea is that in the end, you can end up with, with sort of three possibilities. You can end up with a, a single particle, which is great, right? We had two components, we're down to one. You can end up with two components, uh, this way or this way or this way. And that's sort of fine, right? Essentially, the components have bounced off of each other. It's not a big deal. Um, but the bad thing is that actually you can end up with more components than you started with. And, uh, and this is sort of the simplest example where that happens in such a way that actually you're really in deep trouble. And in particular, the expected number of components after such a collision is two. And so we started off with two components and they collided and we ended up with two components on average. And so this collision in some sense shouldn't count, right? It's not contributing to our drift condition. 
Um, so we have to make sure that this doesn't happen too often, right? Because these guys we really can't count. Um, on the one hand, big com components are relatively scarce, so we expect this to not happen too frequently. On the other hand, if you go through it carefully, it turns out this happens sort of just frequently enough that it can't be ignored. In other words, there is actually a contribution to the drift condition due to this sort of thing happening. And so you have to make sure, since there's some contribution, that the contribution doesn't completely destroy any gains that you've, have in, that you've had before. Okay, so those are sort of the major obstacles, right? That we have this coalescence process. It seems like everything should be fine. We, we have this coalescence process. We're coupling the constrained icing process. We have very, very many collisions for the, uh, for the coalescence process. If the coupling goes well for long enough, that translates at least into a moderate number of collisions for the constrained icing process. And then we have to check that those collisions are basically okay, that they're between small components, that they don't bounce off each other all of the time, and uh, that there aren't too many of these ghost particles that we're miscounting. But in the end, you can do that, and once all of these, uh, these bounds are together, you end up with the drift condition. There's just sort of uh, a little bit of fuzz to worry about. While you're keeping track of all of these initial components that are colliding with each other and merging, you have to make sure that you don't end up creating too many additional components. Um, and it turns out that like the large components, this, is sort of, this happens sort of just frequently enough that you have to worry about it. In other words, over this epsilon n cubed time scale, you do end up with a bunch of other components, number of components that's sort of roughly comparable to the number of components that you started with, um, but it turns out a, a sort of small number compared to that, and so that also doesn't derail um, getting the sort of drift condition. Okay, so as I said, um, everything works out here, um, but unlike the sort of first two parts of the bound, it works out in a rather specialized way, and in particular, you really have to take advantage of what the constrained icing process looks like and how these collisions are really happening in order to get this sort of drift condition. So that's basically it. This is more or less what I wanted to say, and I think I spoke relatively quickly. Um, so the initial heuristic due to Aldous was that uh, this constrained icing process looks basically like simple random walk. That's more or less true at stationarity. Um, the sort of new heuristic was that at, at high density, it doesn't look very much like simple random walk at all. Uh, it looks a little bit like the coalescence process. Not a lot like the coalescence process, but just sort of enough like the coalescence process in order to be able to get a bound. And really the, the sort of main difficulty in the proof is creating, is creating some sort of upper bound on the mixing time, which lets us actually, uh, which lets us actually write down the mixing of the, cola, of, the, of the icing process in terms of these two things, which have already been well studied by others. Okay. So I, I didn't say anything for the uh, conjectures uh, talk uh, an hour ago, so I should give a few conjectures relating to this. Um, I think, of course, the most important is uh, what's going on, uh, is sort of getting the correct answer, and in particular, getting rid of these, uh, these log terms. For, so for dimension d greater than or equal to three, I think the answer almost certainly is n cubed. For dimension two, I suspect the answer is d cubed log n, although I'm a little bit less confident about that one. Um, the main difficulty in sort of getting these right bounds for the type, for the type of argument that I've, I've just given um, is that over, when, you're, when you're dealing with it, well, all of the problem comes from the drift condition. If the drift condition were, were sort of a, as good as one could hope, there would be no problem here. You would get the right answer. And so what goes wrong with the drift condition so that I get the wrong answer? And basically the answer is that, as I said, when you're dealing with this drift condition and forcing particles to collide with each other, um, you, mo you, you basically end up getting all of the particles that were sitting there at the beginning. And furthermore, when you're, you're creating some new particles and you can sort of couple them into the coalescence process. In other words, you can sort of do this drift condition in phases and deal with what's happening within each phase and, and really sort of tighten up the bound if you were interested in. The difficulty is that those new particles that are getting created and also the particles that, involve, that, that, involve, that are involved in collisions that sort of bounce off of each other, those aren't random generic particles. Those are particles that are extremely close to each other. And as far as I know, the coalesce, at least the coalescence um, time bounds that I'm aware of can't take advantage of that fact, can't take advantage of the fact that every time you restart, you end up with these particles that are much, much closer to each other than you would expect. And in particular, when you have two particles that bounce off of each other, which happens sort of one third of the time, it really isn't one third of the time that they bounce off of each other. They're extremely likely to sort of have another collision immediately afterwards, and you should find some way to count that. And if you can't count that, you end up getting sort of the wrong answer here. So, uh, so that's the conjecture and, uh, and sort of the main obstacle to doing this sort of argument. Um, the other thing that I think is sort of interesting is dealing with other densities. So uh, initially I was really more interested in sort of what's, what's happening at larger densities um, and, and how this argument changes. So 
OK, so of course, as always, you can push it a little bit. In particular, you can go from c equals a constant to c, say, little o of log n without too much difficulty. Um, the first thing that breaks down in pushing this is, uh, is the splitting lemma, and in particular, the sort of exponential term that pops up. The exponential term is basically false, so we expect to be able to push through that barrier without so much difficulty. Um, but the argument falls apart completely at roughly c equals root n. So in other words, density 1 over root n, um, because the simple random walk heuristic is, uh, is still going to be pretty good locally, but is extremely, extremely bad globally uh, once you get around there. So that's sort of the, the large density case. I wasn't going to say anything about low density, um, except there have been a number of talks about what happens uh, uh, to mixing times when you're uh, sort of best case versus worst case. And, uh, and maybe low density is otherwise not so interesting, but is a little bit interesting for that. Um, in particular, for c sort of order of one and also c large, the best case and the worst case can't be too far apart from each other. Um, in particular, you, uh, the, the lower bound that you get from the coalescence process um, also turns into sort of a lower bound on the mixing time. It turns out even if you don't start at a very high density regime, you still get essentially the same lower bound. And so, so these two arguments have to be at least very close to each other. When c is very small, that's no longer the case. Um, and in particular, when c is sort of uh, less than a half or so, uh, don't quote me on that, but certainly for a sort of a small number, um, you no longer have to worry about coalescence events if you start at the best possible state. In other words, if you start at just one particle. And so the best case mixing time there is going to be substantially smaller than the worst case mixing time or the average case mixing time. And then if you let c get smaller and smaller and smaller, much, much less than the constant, um, then there's again another split. The average case mixing time we expect should be, the average case now should be sort of like the best case and should be substantially different from the worst case. So, so something else happens down there, and I think the analysis probably is, uh, is not so bad. And in particular, the balance that we have in our argument more or less are, uh, are sort of monotone in C sufficiently small. OK. There's sort of one last natural question, and this one is perhaps uh, the easiest one at least to get started on, which is what happens to other graphs. Um, so I was talking only about the lattice. I, I take advantage of the lattice a little bit, but not very much. And so there's some question what happens to other graphs. Um, and so the answer for some graphs is quite easy. In particular, if your graph is bounded degree and the mixing time is, uh, is very, very small, so in particular, if you have a bounded degree expander, then everything basically should go through more or less um, as it did here. And the same result is going to apply with essentially the same proof. The only difference is we're not going to have nice log Sobolev constants necessarily, but as long as you have spectral gap that's, uh, that's extremely large, the mixing time bound you get from comparison there is sort of good enough that it doesn't matter. So for very quickly mixing graphs, everything is basically fine. You get the same answer. Um, in some sense, I feel a little bit bad throwing this at the end in that certainly if you're dealing with a computer network, that's the obvious thing to do, right? You shouldn't put your computer network on a lattice. Uh, if you want information flow to be rapid, you should put it on some sort of expander graph. But the answer is that even though the bounds that we get aren't quite as nice as Cox's and Yao's, they're good enough to get the broad mixing characteristic to be exactly the same. Uh, yes, this is fair. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe only if you have an option on how to, to set things up. <laughs> yeah, okay, so maybe that's difficult. If you're sending it into, I don't know what happens in the, anyway, okay. <laughs> They're often loaded. Than that. Ah, oh, okay, so now I feel better about it as well. And, and somehow we expect the, the uh, well, not planar, but at least sort of embeddable in, in, in three dimensions to be, to be very similar. Um, and then as the graph mixes more slowly, sort of bad things start to happen. Um, and in particular, the, the, the sorts of uh, the comparison to the coalescence process, um, the coupling that we write down ends up breaking down on sort of relevant time scales. And so it turns out that the lattice in dimension two is, is sort of exactly on that, uh, on that boundary. Um, it sort of mixes quickly enough that one can hope to push through the argument and everything should be sort of okay. But as soon as you're anything slower than, than that walk, um, things are, are more or less not going to work, or at least one will have to be substantially more careful. So the conjecture is that essentially the, the, the thing I wrote down at the beginning should still be true even for slowly mixing, uh, for walks, for graphs that, uh, that have very slowly mixing random walk, but, uh, but the proof strategy will have to, uh, to at least be substantially more careful. And uh, that's everything, so thank you very much.